Hey, good afternoon. I, go, I hope you're all interested in uh, learning how to inject real-world data to your products. Uh, you got a lot of map lovers in here? All right, yeah, yeah. I'll, I owe you a beer. Uh, so I work for Mapbox. My name is David Rhodes. I'm a software engineer working on the Unity SDK. Um, so my background is in uh, visual effects and film. I've worked in AAA uh, video game industry and uh, also with robotics. Um, I made my first game in math class with a graphing calculator. And I have a, uh, sorry, I skipped that. <laughs> I um, made my first game in math class with a graphing calculator. And I have a fondness for game design. Ever since I was a small child, I built like a cardboard arcade machines, you know, just make believe, pretend. Um, so my transition to Mapbox was six months ago. And uh, ever since I joined, I've seen so much potential with building new experiences. Uh, if you think about where augmented reality is going, uh, we know more about the world than ever before, and we're mapping it. There's big data. Uh, so this is all exciting times. Uh, today, I'd like to show you how we intend to, whoops, uh, long way. So uh, this is a technical presentation for the most part. So I'll show you how to build a map kind of like this. Uh, the original presentation had 20 minutes, but I went through it, and it actually took less time. So I'm going to add some fluff. Uh, so Mapbox, a little bit of history about Mapbox. Uh, we build location tools for developers. We're a geospatial data uh, provider and platform. So rather than uh, building games and applications ourselves, we enable developers to do that with key building blocks. So you can add location uh, and world context to your applications, websites, or Unity projects. Um, Mapbox has crazy fast and highly customizable SDKs for Android, iOS, and Qt, and of course, Unity now. So, uh, we have over 70,000 active developers building with the Mapbox platform, including companies like the Weather Channel. Over 300 million people touch maps every single uh, month. We offer three core products, uh, maps, navigation, and geocoding, which is like searching. So if you want to search for a place, you can get a latitude and longitude. If you have a latitude and longitude, you can search for what's around that area. But today, we'll explore maps. So uh, before we begin uh, with the technical presentation, I'd like to ask how many of you are actually actively developing or planning to develop an application that uses, utilizes real-world data? All right, so a fair number. Cool. Uh, it, you know, it's very interesting to think about the role that maps have played in entertainment. And how, uh, <laughs> for example, how many of you recognize uh, this here? Nobody? Really? You, you all lack imagination. Uh, it's a treasure map, right? Like, <laughs> you know what that is. Uh, we, we, we played with those when we were kids. So. Um, this was like the first evolution of maps in context of play, at least for me personally. So uh, it's, it's only logical that the majority of video games have adapted maps, right? Like from the very beginning, video games have had a concept of maps. And I think this bridges from our sense of like exploration and our desire to learn more about the spaces around us. In fact, uh, the graphing calculator game that I made in high school uh, was a top-down RPG game with ASCII art. So it was like the map world was built with characters. Perhaps some of you have played gems like these. Uh, anybody recognize that game? Thank you. Uh, nobody knows that one. Maybe any, somebody play Firewatch? That's this map mechanic was so cool. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the evolution, uh, technology has gotten better, but maps, like just the, the breadth of, of maps in video games, the types of maps there are, how abstract you can get with maps. But that was just the beginning phase 
of maps in video games because humans are social creatures and we crave community, um, especially gamers. But thankfully, we're always learning more about the world around us and we have better tools to communicate than ever before. Mobile phones, uh, always connected, location services have changed the game. For example, the iPhone 3GS added support for location services roughly 10 years ago, um, but we've come a long way since then. Let's have a look at what happens when you merge the virtual uh, experience with the real world around us, some of the experiences that developers have built. You can see like the aesthetics, uh, just so many different possibilities of how you can render the real world around us. Um, anybody played this niche game? So uh, there's something magical that happens when you use real world locations and map it to sort of a different environment or you know, change the aesthetics. It mimics reality, but there's something, like you recognize where you are, but you're still in that, that mode of like escapism or uh, exploration. Suddenly the world you're building becomes recognizable, adds a new level of experience by including our mental model of the world. So if you think about the types of things you can do with the real world around us for video games, it doesn't have to be what Pokemon Go did, for example. Um, take, for example, if you just have knowledge of the global elevation model of the world around us, you can build something like this, simply drape satellite imagery on top, add some post-processing effects, and now you've got this sort of like real-time strategy game that you can add navigation meshes to. Uh, at runtime now. So um, if you look at Apple just announced AR kit, anybody already experimented with that? All right, it's very cool, right? Um, I think Niantic already announced that they're going to add support for that. So imagine how much cooler that, that experience will be. Uh, but if you also know more about the, the world around you, places and buildings and parks and land use areas, um, we, I had a slide of Final Fantasy V up there. If you think about the data that, that we know about around us, you can use that to create sort of maps that mimic Final Fantasy art style, for example. Uh, there's been a trend of like retro style graphics, but now you can create something like that using real world data. So have like sprite mountains and sprite forests using real world data. <clears throat> or you could abstract it in such a way that it only slightly resembles the environment around us, but adds a new dimension to that experience. Um, does anybody recognize this location? <laughs> he says it's from Minecraft. It's not actually. Uh, this was made with the Mapbox Unity SDK, but that's uh, Crater Lake in Oregon. I could talk about maps all day, um, seriously, stop by the booth and test me on that. But I think it's time to dive into the technical demo. So let's build a map with Mapbox. <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about, just waiting for a we'll switch. Um, so the Mapbox Unity SDK is composed of a couple different layers, I would consider them. The first is that we have a C-sharp wrapper around our API endpoints. Uh, so this is doing basic stuff like formatting URLs so you can access uh, specific tiles that you want to fetch, download them, decode them, serve them as GeoJSON. And this is kind of like a standalone, you could use it as a standalone C-sharp library. But in addition to that, we also have some Unity components that are specific to uh, what we're trying to build, what we expect developers will want to do. For example, creating geometry, 
from this uh, GeoJSON data, maybe adding colliders, setting layers, uh, modifying your game objects, and just generally customizing the aesthetics of your map or the world around you. Um, so with that said, uh, one thing I'll note here is that a lot of this is built on uh, scriptable objects, and we have a factory paradigm. So scriptable objects, if you haven't watched Richard Fine's talk on uh, overturning the mono behavior tyranny, I suggest you watch that. It's a great talk. Um, so I'll open up. Uh, I've got a couple scenes here that will sort of walk us through stages, sort of like mimicking the progression of maps uh, or how we were going to build this, almost as if you started from scratch and were iterating through uh, in your normal development process. So every uh, map object has, or every scene should have this sort of map object. And we can specify a few different things here. A latitude longitude is sort of like our st starting point of where we want the center of our map to be. And you can specify a zoom level, which represents sort of like the region that you want to cover for uh, your area. Like, uh, it's almost like a level of detail, but in terms of geospatial data. Um, and then there's what we call a map visualizer. And this is what describes the factories that you use to generate your data. Again, this is a scriptable object, and as are all of the factories and modifiers that we use uh, down the tree. So for now, we'll just uh, create a raster map. This is just a 2D map, um, and we'll put it on some flat terrain, because we need a mesh to actually just see the texture. So yeah, I can look at any of these and see that um, they've got some basic parameters that we can use to customize uh, what this looks like, how it's built. Um, and these are all abstract factories, by the way. So you can write your own concrete implementations to, to do whatever you need. Um, the flat terrain, for example, just creates a simple quad. So if I hit, hit play, it's actually going to go to the server and, uh, whoops, and fetch me some tiles. And then I'll just build that stuff with those factories and project it onto my quads. So this is Central Park in New York City. Not very exciting yet, right? <laughs> Let's take it to the next uh, level. So Mapbox has a global uh, elevation model. The entire world is covered, so we know, uh, you know the height of the terrain. Um, so we look at this map object, and we can see that we've got uh, visualizers again. But this time, I'm not using a flat terrain object. I'm using a, a terrain factory. And this has uh, some extra parameters, like the resolution of my terrain. This is how many vertices by how many vertices each, um, each sort of tile will be represented with. Um, you can add a, an additional height modifier to sort of like you know, skew the world for exaggeration. Um, of course, you can assign materials to that, that mesh. and and then it's still got the same raster tile. Uh, so if we look at that. This area is actually quite flat. It's hard to see uh, that it actually has any terrain. But if I go into scene view, whoops, you can kind of see there's some, some subtle terrain there, or su some elevation. And if I look at the wireframe, you can see there's some you know, slight curvature. Clearly, Central Park is not the best place uh, for elevation. But let's, uh, let's do a quality pass. Um, and with this quality pass, I wanted to sort of like increase the resolution of the terrain, because what I'm going to do is exaggerate it, and I want to smooth out uh, that interpolation uh, for the terrain. And then also, uh, the raster was looking a little blurry, so I'm going to create some MIP maps so that there's no noise you know, further off. Uh, request a retina resolution. And by the way, I forgot to mention, but I've been fetching a styled raster map. So that's what this, this uh, URL or this ID here is. And that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, so if we look at this, now you can see you know, we're starting to get some, some smoother terrain here. Looks a little bit better. 
the textures aren't quite as, as blurry as they were. But it's still not very exciting. So let's, let's talk about vector tiles. Uh, vector tiles and code geometry and metadata about the world around us. So this includes things like buildings and streets, land uses, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so in this scene, we've also added a mesh factory. And the mesh factory is essentially the vector tile factory, but we most commonly use them to construct meshes. So in every vector tile, there's a, a series of layers. And in this case, we're going to use the building layer. And it has its own visualizer, which, where you can specify the key for the layer that you're using. You can filter out aspects that you don't wish to create geometry for. And uh, you can have a series of stacks. These also have the ability to like customize different types of data that's contained in, in that layer. Uh, this just has a default stack, so it's going to create geometry for all of the buildings that we know about in these tiles. And then there's a series of mesh modifiers, which know how to modify and directly interact with the meshes. Um, so for example, this has a snap terrain modifier. It's actually doing uh, a query on the terrain layer to see like where it should place the buildings. Um, it knows how to construct polygons and extrude them, uh, layout UVs, and then uh, offset the height based on the height metadata that we also contain in that layer, that feature. And then we can add a texture, which also has the ability to specify materials. So if I hit play, All right, so we're starting to get a little bit more detailed. It's, it's more interesting to look at. Um, you can see we've got some pretty high quality data. You know, there's this building here that's actually got some additional geometry created on the top there. And this data, by the way, is uh, constantly being updated and improved. So if I go to the, let's do another quality pass. And for this one, maybe we want to add a light because uh, you know it was looking boring with the those flat colors. Um, let's just see what what happens here. Maybe some post processing effects. Got some ambient occlusion. Got some shadows. Um, I actually went into our web interface for modifying the style that I've been using for the raster map, and I disabled most of the labels. We don't need them, so it looks a lot cleaner like this. Um, there's still a label on the water, apparently. <laughs> but you can see the footpaths and the, the roads. Now, that's all rendered uh, on our servers and delivered to you, so when you update your style and, and studio, you can customize the visuals as you want there. Just give it the, the URL or the ID for the map. And then when you fetch the raster tiles, that's what you get. It's sort of a what you see is what you get. Um, then we can start making it even more interesting. This is sort of like uh, what Pokemon Go is doing, is finding places of interest or nearby uh, regions that might be important to you if you want to add gameplay based on buildings that are around you. We can extract the POI label layer from our vector tiles and splat them on our map because we know they're geo-coordinates. So uh, we can sort of just cruise around and see various locations. And these have been filtered by some metadata that's included in those, such as scale rank, which describes sort of like how big that point of interest might be, and local rank, which might be its like local importance or uh, popularity. And that was uh, constructed with the, uh, the POI visualizer. So you can see it's just fetching this key from the vector tile, and then modifying it with, in this case, a uh, 
scale rank filter, so we're filtering out some, some objects. That way we don't have you know, too many. And uh, it's stack, which has a prefab that it just uh, ray casts down. And so you noticed some of those um, were projected onto the, the buildings, and others were uh, projected on the ground. That's because we also added some uh, game object modifiers to the buildings, so we can look at that. Now there's a collider modifier and a layer modifier, so it'll actually add those game objects that get instantiated into a specific layer, and then also add a collider. So now you can raycast, you can do layer masks with your raycast for efficiency. But I think what you're all here for is uh, to learn how to actually improve your uh, games with this for gameplay purposes, adding some interactive elements. As I said, Mapbox is not just a data provider, but also a data platform, uh, a geospatial platform. We want to enable developers to make uh, beautiful experiences. So I, I created um, one additional script uh, for this demo, um, but the rest of it was generated with some of the existing uh, scriptable objects that we have to get started. And so this is Central Park. Uh, but with a little bit of beautification, we've added some like wooded areas where we know that that land use has uh, wood and like forest and some grassy areas. We've still got the points of interest. And we've got a little gaze indicator that shows you, uh, ooh, it's kind of small, that shows you some details about that. So this is a, well, I think we knew it was a theater, but. <laughs> We can also uh, geocode buildings and see its address or maybe some business names, things like that. And for like these playgrounds, I've just uh, detected that there's a playground in that layer uh, and then raycasted and splatted a prefab at that location. So it's sort of just uh, randomly distribu distributing these props within a certain polygon. So um, that's sort of the, the mapping in a nutshell. We're obviously uh, actively growing this, and we're adding features. But I'll jump back over to uh, my, my slide. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, I did mention uh, mixed reality in the, in the title, so the reason why is because uh, you know, ARKit was a really exciting announcement, and, but it's, it's super simple to integrate this stuff. That's kind of why I made this little gaze indicator, so you could actually like, aim at the things that you're interested in interacting with. But um, I'd like to invite you to visit the booth if you want to see a demo uh, live with Mapbox and AR kit, and we also have some other uh, AR examples that we can show you. Um, you can download the SDK from our website, and we're open source on GitHub. So check out the repo, give us feedback, uh, tell us what kind of features you want to see, or directly contribute. I'll upload this demo on GitHub, and uh, if you follow me on Twitter, which I forgot to include the handle here, <laughs> yes. Uh, then, then I'll let you know where that where that's posted. Uh, but it's your turn, so go create the next evolution of treasure maps. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to to ask them. I can answer now, or definitely stop by the booth. If not, uh, so with regards to pricing, something about the pricing. Yeah. So um, Mapbox has uh, what I would consider a generous free tier. In terms of development, you can download the SDK for free. You can get an API key for free, and then it's. Uh, for most use cases, it's like free to develop with just because of the number of map views that you would actually need. Um, if you're targeting mobile platforms, like you're making a, a game that has like MMO-like components, then it's free to uh, like 
40,000 daily active users. So it's just based on daily active users. And don't quote me on that number, but it's somewhere in that range. Um, you can check out our pricing on the mapbox.com slash pricing. Or you can reach out to our sales team if you have like a specific need and you want to discuss uh, your custom case. Uh, if you're targeting like, uh, like web, then we're, it's based on map views. And that's monthly, 50,000 map views a month. So, and then after that, you, you'll want to talk to our salespeople. In what resolution do you have for the terrain in arcs of a second? So one arc of a second, three arcs? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, the resolution for the terrain is like 10 meters, 30 meters. Ah, uh, yeah. One arc of a second, three arcs. Yeah, it's uh, within 10 meters. So one arc, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the detailed data? Is it available for all the countries? I guess, I guess it's only maybe uh, United States or perhaps Europe as well. I mean, with buildings. To, uh, altitude, stuff like that? Yeah, um, we get this question quite often. It's actually, we're global. Uh, we have global coverage. Obviously, you know, some countries have more data than others, uh, just based on population and things like that. I think, you know, Western Europe and North America have the best coverage. But as I said before, we're always up updating that data. If you have a specific region that's lacking in data, we have our own data team. And so you can discuss this with them. Um, do you have um, point of interest search, like um, give me churches or give me museums around the point? Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's considered reverse geocoding. If you have a location, latitude, longitude, you can do a reverse geocode with that and find out what's nearby. So to just return a list of features that are around that area. In addition to that, though, the buildings also contain metadata, so you can filter through the buildings to say, like, these are all the churches, um, these are all the schools, whatever. Um, something I didn't show in this demo is that you can also style based on the fil like the stacks. Uh, so if you have like a church stack or a school stack, you can you know, change the colors of those or whatever. Um, if you download the SDK, it has a bunch of built-in examples that sort of show that off. Hi, um, I was wondering, um, does the result uh, the, this, this uh, town generated, can it be uh, generated as a modifying, modifiable object uh, that could be used, for example, a, a game map or something like that? Um, if I understand what you're asking, are you, do you mean like you could edit the map at edit time, like design time, yep. and make changes. So uh, our terms of service are, I think, difficult in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can do is, and we're planning to add this feature in the future, is to build that map at edit time. And they can use that to sort of like place additional game objects, do uh, some extra decoration, maybe use it as like a your base layer to build in higher level meshes, or mm -hmm. say I want to bring in uh, like a famous landmark and put it in my map where I know that is, and you can offset, you know, adjust the scale, then export that data or save that as its own like sort of additive scene. So you fetch the maps, and then you also lay then your own custom data. Um, but we also have like file caching and memory caching of the tiles, so. It's ambient uh, file caching. Once you've fetched a tile, then it's just saved on the, the user's disk. So that at least you don't have to hit the, the web every single time. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you face some uh, optimization problems when you want to uh, render a big chunk of a map. Uh, yeah, I mean, it'll depend on what you're trying to build with your application or game. But we're trying to make this as optimized as possible. Of course, you know, some of that's on the developers to, to do, to reduce the number of draw calls. In terms of our vector tiles, those are quite lightweight, uh, very cheap. Like, this data is very small. Uh, and actually, generating that is sort of like the, the majority of the cost. But for example, in that, that last demo that I showed with the trees and things, that was using material instancing. So 
the, the, the number of draw calls was drastically reduced. All of the buildings were sharing the same material. Uh, you can do things like that. Mind? Yes, it's it probably more on our. Yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff like object pooling, so we reuse textures as often as possible. We're yeah, cool. I think we're out of time. Thanks for coming to the talk. I really appreciate it.